Welcome to chapter 3.2. We'll be looking at one-dimensional heat transfer in a sphere, and specifically we're looking at radial conduction through that spherical shell. So we'll start with the generic form for Fourier's law, which has an area dependence, and we know that as the radius of a sphere increases, the surface area through which heat transferring radially moves is also increasing. So we need to incorporate the area for a sphere into Fourier's law. That area, of course, is four pi r squared. And this is for the heat flow. If we want to calculate the heat flux, there is no area dependence because it's normalized. It's a flux. So we don't see um, any additional r dependence in the expression for heat flux. Coming back to the heat flow, let's integrate this. We recognize that it's an ordinary first order differential equation and that it's separable. So if we separate the R terms from the T terms and we'll integrate between a generic inner radius at temperature Ti and a generic outer radius at temperature T outer and performing that integral um, we're able to calculate the heat flow in terms of boundary conditions and constants related to the system. And so that expression is slightly more complicated than Fourier's law for slabs or cylinders. But in any instance where we want to know something related to heat for a sphere, this is the equation that we'll use. Next, we need to calculate the heat equation in a sphere, and this will enable us to calculate temperature profiles in the radial direction. So we start with the energy balance, and we'll assume that this is at steady state, so there's no accumulation term. We only have in, out, and net generation. And we'll also assume that the generation is constant with a value of QV. So writing out this expression, we have that the heat transfer area at a radius position r is 4 pi r squared. So we multiply that area by the heat flux at that position. And now if we go an incremental distance further out in the spherical shell, we're at position r plus delta r, and the surface area there is 4 pi quantity r plus delta r squared, and we multiply that by the flux at the position r plus delta r. And finally, we get to the generation term, which we multiply by the volume of the differential shell. And again, we use this strange convention where volumes aren't the way you would normally calculate them. They're made for a differential. So we look at the surface area, 4 pi r squared, and just multiply that by an incremental delta r and when we take the limit, as delta r goes to zero, we'll converge on the correct volume. So in this instance, we're going to divide all of the terms by 4 pi and delta r, but we're not going to divide out the r squared. And one way of seeing why that's true is if we were to divide the second term by r squared, we'd end up with this messy set of cross terms. So it's easier to just leave the r squared in place and compute that as part of the derivative. So rewriting our equation, we put it into the differential form, and then we take the limit as delta r goes to zero, and we're able to calculate the heat equation for a sphere. Um, again, this is the generic solution. It can be, uh, you can apply the chain rule to this, and you can substitute in Fourier's law to get the temperature dependence that we'll use in calculating temperature profiles. And so again, the heat flux is negative K dt dr. So we plug that into our heat equation and arrive at probably the most useful form for the heat equation in a sphere. Thanks, I will see you for the next chapter.